Hello, and welcome to General Astronomy Lecture 26, The Lives of Stars. We inhale oxygen with every breath. Iron-bearing hemoglobin in our blood carries this oxygen through our bodies. Chains of carbon and nitrogen form the backbone of the proteins, fats, and carbohydrates in our cells. Calcium strengthens our bones, while sodium and potassium ions moderate communications of the nervous system. What does all this biology have to do with astronomy? Well, the profound answer, recognized only in the second half of the 20th century, is that life is based on the elements created by stars. Hydrogen and helium were produced in the Big Bang, and stars later created heavy elements, excuse me, heavier elements that stellar explosions scattered into space. There, in the space between the stars, these elements mixed with interstellar gas and became incorporated into subsequent generations of stars. In this lecture, we will discuss the origins of the elements in detail by delving into the lives of stars. Keep in mind that no matter how far removed the stars may seem from our everyday lives, they are actually connected to us in the most intimate way possible. Without the lives and deaths of stars, none of us would be here. We are truly made of star stuff. The story of a star's life is in many ways the story of an extended battle between two opposing forces, gravity and pressure. Under certain circumstances, gravity can overcome pressure in interstellar gas, causing fragments of a molecular cloud to contract into protostars, and gravity's advantage over pressure continues until fusion begins in a star's core. Once hydrogen fusion begins, the energy it generates balances the energy that the star radiates into space. With energy balanced, the star's internal pressure stabilizes and halts the crush of gravity. The star is then in a state of equilibrium, much like that of our sun, with thermal pressure balancing gravity and fusion uh, energy from the core balancing the flow of radiation energy from the star's surface. A star can remain in this state of balance for millions to billions of years, but it will eventually exhaust the hydrogen in its core. When that happens, fusion ceases in the core and gravity regains the upper hand over pressure. The battle between pressure and gravity then grows increasingly more dramatic with a final outcome that depends on the star's mass at birth. So this image here just shows you perhaps what a star like our sun might look like over time. It will eventually expand into a red giant and then it will turn into what we call a planetary nebula, which you'll learn about, I believe, in our next lecture. So let's start to look at a star's life. Now, if you recall, our last lecture was on, or our last two lectures really, were on protostars, uh, which led us up until the point fusion began in a star. So let's kind of work from there as a main sequence star and see what happens throughout these lives. In their cores, main sequence stars are all fundamentally alike. As we saw previously, it is in their cores that all such stars convert hydrogen into helium via thermonuclear reactions. The total time that a star will spend fusing hydrogen into helium in its core, and thus the total time that it will spend as a main sequence star, is called its main sequence lifetime. A protostar becomes a main sequence star when steady hydrogen fusion begins in its core, and it achieves hydrostatic equilibrium. That is, the balance between the inward force of gravity and the outward pressure produced by the fusion. Such a freshly formed main sequence star is called a zero-age main sequence star. We make the distinction between main sequence and zero age main sequence because a star undergoes noticeable changes in luminosity, surface temperature, and radius during its main sequence lifetime. Main sequence stars with large masses have much greater luminosities than ones with small masses, which means that their cores must release fusion energy at a much greater rate. Stars with large masses have greater fusion rates because they come into energy balance with high core temperatures, or higher core temperatures than those of lower mass stars. All stars approach hydrostatic equilibrium through gravitational contraction, which converts the gravitational potential energy into thermal energy. However, stars of greater mass release larger amounts of gravitational potential energy and therefore heat up more rapidly achieving the temperatures necessary for hydrogen fusion earlier in the process of, con uh, of contraction. As a result, these stars come into equilibrium with a larger size, a greater luminosity, and a higher core temperature than less massive stars. Because the rate of fusion increases rapidly with temperature, 
Massive stars achieve equilibrium with fusion rates far higher than those of less mass stars. High mass stars consume their hydrogen so rapidly that they end up with much shorter lifetimes than low mass stars, even though they have much more hydrogen for fusion. In other words, the mass of a main sequence star determines both its luminosity and its lifetime because it determines the core temperature and fusion rate at which the star can remain in gravitational equilibrium. So what happens to a star like the Sun after the core hydrogen has been used up so that it is no longer a main sequence star? As we will see, it expands dramatically to become a red giant. To understand why this happens, it is useful to first look at how a star evolves during its main sequence lifetime. The nature of that evolution depends on whether its mass is less than or greater than about 0.4 solar masses. So we will split this up. The main sequence lifetime of a star depends critically on its mass. As this table here shows, massive stars have short main sequence lifetimes. The greater core pressure created by a larger total mass causes nuclear reactions to occur more rapidly and burn through the available hydrogen fuel more quickly. Hence, even though a massive main sequence star contains much more hydrogen fuel in its core than in its entire volume of a red dwarf, a massive star exhausts its hydrogen much more quickly. More rapid burning also produces a greater luminosity so that massive stars are far more luminous. Thus, a main sequence star's mass, again, determines not only its luminosity, but also how long it remains a main sequence star. So this table here just tries to show you multiple properties together, kind of all in one place. So as I say with every single table that we have, this is an excellent resource for you to come back to if you need it. So let's break this up and see what happens. So we're going to look um, at what happens for a star uh, with a mass greater than 0.4 solar masses. So a star undergoes noticeable changes in luminosity, surface temperature, and radius during its main sequence lifetime. These changes are a result of the core hydrogen fusion, which alters the chemical composition of the core. As an example, when our sun first form, formed, its composition was the same at all points throughout its volume. By mass, about 74% hydrogen, 25% helium, and 1% heavier elements. But as these figures show, the sun's core now contains a greater mass of helium than hydrogen. So the whole point of this slide is just to say that the composition changes. So um, here's how much uh, hydrogen there is in the sun based on percentage, so 0% to 100%. And this is distance from the sun's center. So here's the core and then working outward to the surface at the dashed line. Notice that when... Um, the sun formed four and a half billion years ago, it was 75-ish percent hydrogen everywhere throughout the star because that's what the solar um, nebula was made out of. But in the core, it's converting hydrogen into helium. So today, there is less hydrogen than there was in the past in the core. And as a result, it's basically just the opposite. There was only about 25% helium throughout the sun when it first formed. But because hydrogen was creating helium in the core, now there is a lot more of that helium in the core today than there was before. So the composition is changing. Thanks to core hydrogen fusion, the total number of atomic nuclei in a star's core decreases with time. In each reaction, four hydrogen nuclei are converted into a single helium nucleus. With fewer particles bouncing around to provide the core's internal pressure, the core contracts slightly under the weight of the star's outer layers. Compression makes the core denser and increases its temperature. As a result of these changes in density and temperature, the pressure in the compressed core is actually higher than before. As the star's core shrinks, its outer layers expand and shine more brightly. Here's why. As the core's density and temperature increase, hydrogen nuclei in the core collide with one another more frequently and so the rate of core hydrogen fusion increases. Hence, the star's release of energy increases, with, uh, which increases the star's luminosity. The radius of the star as a whole also increases slightly because increased core pressure pushes outward on the star's outer layers. The star's surface temperature changes as well, 
because it is rated, related to luminosity and radius. As an example, theoretical calculations indicate that over the past 4.5 billion years, our sun has become 40% more luminous, grown 6% in radius, and increased in surface temperature by about 300 degrees Kelvin. The story is somewhat different for the least massive main sequence stars, with masses between 0 0.08, which was the minimum mass for um, a star, and 0.4 solar masses. These stars, of spectral class type M, are classified as red dwarfs because they are small in size and have a red color due to their low surface temperatures. They are also very numerous. About 85% of all stars in the Milky Way galaxy are red dwarfs. In a red dwarf, helium does not accumulate in the core to the same extent as in the sun's core. The reason is that in red, red dwarfs, there are convection cells of rising and falling gas that extend throughout the, cores, uh, throughout the star's entire volume and penetrate deep into the core. These convection cells drag up helium from the core and replace it with hydrogen from the outer layers. The fresh hydrogen can undergo thermonuclear fusion that releases energy and makes additional helium. This helium is then dragged out of the core by convection and replaced by even more hydrogen from the red dwarf's outer layers. As a consequence, over a red dwarf's main sequence lifetime, effectively all of the star's hydrogen can be consumed and converted into helium. The core temperature and pressure in a red dwarf is less than that of the sun, so thermonuclear reactions happen more slowly than they do in our own sun. Does it take a long time for a red dwarf to burn through all of its hydrogen? Well, indeed it does. Calculations indicate that it takes hundreds of billions of years for a red dwarf to convert all of its hydrogen into helium. The present age of the universe, though, is only 13.7 billion years, so there has not yet been time for a single red dwarf to become a ball of pure helium, but it will happen in a very long time. So that gives us a hint then. So a red dwarf will end its life as a ball of helium, with no few no further nuclear reactions, but it will still glow due to its internal heat. As it radiates energy into space, it slowly cools and shrinks. This slow, quiet demise is the ultimate fate of red dwarfs. So although we haven't really talked about the deaths of stars, it's just so quick and simple to talk about the deaths of these really low-mass stars here. So we've already covered one death of a star, the entire life of these stars. They just have giant convection cells that replaces hydrogen and helium throughout the star, so it will burn through all of that over hundreds of mil uh, billions of years, and it'll end up as a cool ball of helium floating around in space. So that's the entire life of these stars. Unfortunately for maybe you guys in the class, it's not that simple for everything else. So we'll be going into a lot of detail with the lives of other stars. Speaking of which, let's talk about stars more similar to our own. Hydrogen fusion supplies the thermal energy that maintains a star's thermal pressure and holds gravity at bay. But when a greater than 0.4 solar mass star, uh, star's core, hydrogen is finally depleted, nuclear fusion will cease once it runs out of that fuel. With no further uh, fusion to supply thermal energy and maintain the internal pressure, the star will be out of energy balance for the first time since it was a protostar. In this new stage, hydrogen fusion continues only in a hydrogen-rich material uh, just outside of the core in a situation called shell hydrogen fusion. At first, this process occurs only in the hottest region just outside the core, where the hydrogen fuel has not been exhausted. Outside this region, no fusion reactions take place. Strangely enough, the end of the core hydrogen fusion process leads to an increase in the core's temperature, and here's why. When thermonuclear reactions first cease in the core, nothing remains to generate heat there. Hence, the core starts to cool and the pressure in the core starts to decrease. This pressure decreases, uh, I'm sorry, this pressure decrease allows the star's core to again compress under the weight of the outer layers. But as the core contracts, its temperature will again increase and heat begins to flow outward from the core, even though no nuclear reactions are taking place there. So we have basically this inert core where nothing's really going on, but it's still warm. And then just around the core, there's a thin shell of hydrogen that's still fusing into helium. <laughs> 
This new flow of heat warms the gases around the core, increasing the rate of shell hydrogen fusion and causing the shell of fusion to effectively eat further outward into the surrounding matter. Helium, produced by reactions in the shell, falls down onto the core, which continues to contract and heat up as it gains mass. Over the course of hundreds of millions of years, the core of a one solar mass star compresses to about one third of its original radius, while its central temperature increases from about 15 to about 100 million degrees Kelvin. During this post-main sequence phase, the star's outer layers expand just as dramatically as the core contracts. As the hydrogen fusion uh, shell works its way outward, egged on by the heat from the contracting core, the star's luminosity increases substantially. This increases the star's internal pressure and makes the star's outer layers expand to many times its original radius. This tremendous expansion causes those outer layers to cool down and the star's surface temperature drops. Once the temperature of the star's bloated surface falls to about 3500 Kelvin, the gases glow with a reddish hue in accordance with Wien's law. The star is then appropriately called a red giant. Thus, we see that a red giant star is a former main sequence star that has evolved into a new stage of existence. And so this image here shows you the present day sun and what the sun will look like when it becomes a red giant. Notice it is a lot larger. In fact, it could even engulf the Earth. Red giant stars undergo substantial mass loss due to strong stellar winds because of their large diameters and correspondingly weak surface gravity. This makes it relatively easy for gases to escape from the red giant and into space. A typical red giant loses roughly 10 to the minus 7 solar masses of matter per year. For comparison, the sun's present day mass loss rate is only 10 to the minus 14 solar masses per year. Hence, an evolving star loses a substantial amount of mass as it becomes a red giant. This figure here on the right shows a star losing its mass in such a way. This is the mass loss from a high mass star. Most of the core helium was produced by thermonuclear reactions during the star's main sequence lifetime. During the red giant era, this helium will itself undergo thermonuclear reactions. Fusion occurs when two nuclei come close enough together for the attractive strong force to overcome the electromagnetic repulsion. Helium nuclei have two protons and two neutrons, and hence a greater charge than a hydrogen nucleus with its single proton. The greater charge means that helium nuclei repel each other more strongly than hydrogen nuclei. Helium fusion therefore occurs only when nuclei slam into one another at much higher speeds than those needed for hydrogen fusion, which means that the helium fusion requires a much higher temperature than hydrogen fusion. As the hydrogen fusion shell adds mass to the helium core, the core contracts even further, uh, further increasing the star's central temperature. When the central temperature finally reaches about 100 million degrees Kelvin, core helium fusion, that is the thermonuclear fusion of helium in the core, begins. The helium fusion process, also known as the triple alpha process, because helium nuclei are something sometimes called alpha particles, it converts three helium nuclei into one carbon nuclei. Energy is released because carbon-12 has a slightly lower mass than the three helium-4 nuclei and the lost mass becomes energy in accordance with Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equation. So let's look at how these thermonuclear reactions take place, how this triple alpha process works. Now recall we did talk about the proton-proton chain uh, back when we were discussing hydrogen fusion, but now we are talking about helium fusion. So how does it work? Well, it's a bit of a lengthy process again. Helium fusion occurs in two steps, but they are involved. First, two helium nuclei combine to form a beryllium nucleus. So you can see that reaction on the first line. This particular beryllium isotope, which has four protons and four neutrons, is very unstable and breaks into two helium nuclei soon after it forms. However, in the star's dense core, a third helium nucleus may strike this beryllium-8 nucleus before it has a chance to fall apart. 
Such a collision creates a stable isotope of carbon and releases energy in the form of a gamma ray photon. So that's what you see in the second equation. You see the beryllium, before it falls back apart into helium, colliding with another helium to create carbon-12 and some energy. Some of the carbon nuclei created in this process can fuse with additional helium nuclei to produce a stable isotope of oxygen. So it doesn't happen as often, but this can also create oxygen in the core as well. So um, thus, both carbon and oxygen make up the, quote, ash of helium fusion. The second step in the triple alpha process and the process of oxygen formation both release energy. The pressure resulting from this energy uh, prevents any further gravitational contraction of the star's core. So overall, the main reaction here is that we combine three heliums into a single carbon atom, and then, of course, energy is released in the process. So this slide, I'm not going to read through it, is just a summary of what we just discussed. So it's basically the exact same thing, just shown in a different way, all in a single graphic. Again, I kind of just put it in as a reference for you if you need it. How helium fusion begins at a red giant's center depends on the mass of the star. In high mass red giants, that is, masses greater than 2 to 3 solar masses, helium fusion begins gradually as temperatures in the star's core approach 10 to the 8 Kelvin. In red giants with a mass less than about 2 to 3 solar masses, helium fusion begins explosively and suddenly in what is called the helium flash. The core must be compressed tremendously in order for it to become hot enough for helium fusion to begin. At these extreme pressures and temperatures, the atoms are completely ionized and most of the core consists of nuclei detached from electrons. Eventually, the free electrons become so crowded together that a limit to further compression is reached, and as predicted by a remarkable law of quantum mechanics called the Pauli Exclusion Principle. The Pauli Exclusion Principle is analogous to saying that you can't have two things in the same place at the same time. Just before the onset of helium fusion, the electrons in the core of a low-mass star are so closely crowded together that any further compression would violate this Pauli Exclusion Principle. Because the electrons cannot be squeezed any closer together, they produce a powerful pressure that resists any, any further core contraction. This phenomenon, in which closely packed particles resist compression as a consequence of the Pauli exclusion principle, is called degeneracy. Ast astronomers say that the electrons in a helium-rich core of a low-mass red giant star are degenerate, and that the core is supported by electron degeneracy pressure. This degeneracy pressure, unlike the pressure of a normal gas, does not depend on temperature. Because degeneracy pressure does not increase with temperature, the onset of helium fusion heats the core rapidly without causing it to expand. Instead, the temperature and helium fusion rate spike drastically in what is called a helium flash, releasing an enormous amount of energy into the core. In a matter of seconds, the temperature rises so much that the thermal pressure soon surpasses degeneracy pressure and pushes back against gravity, causing the core to expand. This core expansion pushes the hydrogen-fusing shell outward, lowering its temperature and its fusion rate. The result is that even though uh, the helium core fusion and hydrogen shell fusion are now taking place simultaneously in the star, total energy production falls from its peak during the red giant stage, reducing the star's luminosity and allowing its outer layers to contract somewhat. As the outer layers contract, the star's surface temperature increases, so its color turns back toward yellow from red. To summarize, after the sun spends about a billion years expanding into a luminous red giant, its size and luminosity will decline as it becomes a helium core fusing star. With fusion once again operating in the core, the star regains some sort of balance that it had as a main sequence star except now it is helium fusion that's keeping the central temperature steady. So let's take a look at how these uh, one solar mass stars evolve. This figure summarizes these evolutionary stages in the life of a one solar mass star. Here is the story of Post, 
uh, I'm sorry, of post-main sequence evolution in its briefest form. Before the beginning of core helium fusion, the star's core compresses and the outer layers expand. And just after core helium fusion begins, the core expands and the outer layers compress. We will see in chapter 20 of the book, if you have the book, or we will see in our coming lectures that this behavior, in which the inner and outer regions of the star change in opposite ways, occurs again and again in the final stages of the star's evolution. So this graph is really useful. It shows you what the luminosity is like throughout the age of the star. So you start as a protostar with a high luminosity because it's huge, and it slowly contracts down into a protostar. That star will eventually be warm enough to uh, begin uh, core fusion, so that's the point that it becomes an actual star, a main sequence star. Over time, as we have just seen in the earlier parts of this lecture, the star, like our sun, will get a little bit brighter over time. But then the star leaves the main sequence and becomes a red giant. So it quickly expands in size and its luminosity increases greatly as a result. So the sun becomes a red giant. But if it's less than two to three solar masses, it will have a quick helium flash before coming back down and settling in for a little while. So this just gives you an idea as to what's going on. To see how stars evolve during and after their main sequence lifetimes, it is helpful to follow them on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. On such a diagram, zero-age main sequence stars lie along a line called the zero-age main sequence, or ZAMS, that is given in this figure as a solid pink line. These stars have just emerged from their protostar stage, are steadily fusing hydrogen to helium in their cores, and have attained hydrostatic equilibrium. With the passage of time, hydrogen in a main sequence star uh, core is converted into helium, and so the luminosity slowly increases. The star slowly expands, and the star's position on the HR diagram therefore inches upward and to the right from the zero-age main sequence. So we define zero-age main sequence and main sequence separately because they are slightly different. So as a star like our sun ages, it gets a little bit brighter and a little bit bigger. And if you recall from our discussion on HR diagrams, size of the star goes from bottom left to top right. So it makes sense that it's moving up and to the right. So that gives you an idea as to what's going on so far. And you can see how it moves along this evolutionary track on an HR diagram. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, one more thing on that slide, I apologize. As a result of that motion, the main sequence on an HR diagram is a fairly broad band rather than a narrow line. So instead of just one thin line, stars on the main sequence fill up this whole broad region. Um, so the dashed line figure in the figure denotes uh, stars whose cores have been uh, exhausted of hydrogen and in which the core hydrogen fusion has ceased. These stars have reached the ends of their main sequence lives. From here, the star's outer layers will expand outward at this time, even though its core will be shrinking under the crush of gravity. At first, the sun's life track on an HR diagram will move almost horizontally to the right as the star grows in size to become a, su a subgiant. Then, as the expansion of the outer layer continues, the sun's luminosity will begin to increase substantially and its life track will turn upward on the HR diagram. Over a period of about a billion years, the sun will slowly grow in size and luminosity to become a red giant. At the end of its red giant stage, the sun will be more than a hundred times as large in radius and more than a thousand times as bright in luminosity as it is today. After core helium fusion begins, however, the cores of these stars expand, the outer layers contract, and the evolutionary track backs away from the temporary peak luminosity that we see. The track uh, then wanders back and forth into the red giant region while the star readjusts to their new energy source. This overall result is what we saw a couple of slides ago. We can summarize our understanding of stellar evolution from the birth through the onset of helium fusion by following the evolution of a hypothetical cluster of stars. Stars that make up a cluster all begin to form at essentially the same time, but they do have a different initial masses. 
Hence, studying star clusters allows us to compare how stars of different masses evolve. The eight HR diagrams to come are from a computer simulation of the evolution of 100 stars that all form at the same moment and differ only in initial mass. So we're going to go through eight HR diagrams quickly, um, but I think it's pretty clear how it's laid out. And this is really fascinating to me. So here is figure A. All 100 stars, this is stars in a cluster, a simulated cluster, they begin as cool protostars on the right side of an HR diagram. This should refresh you a little bit of our protostar discussion where you saw something similar. The protostars are spread out uh, on the diagram according to their masses. And the greater the mass, the greater the protostar's initial luminosity. Recall that the source of a protostar's luminosity is its gravitational potential energy. So that is our protostars at the beginning. Slide B. After about three, well, no, let me see. After about 5,000 years here, the most massive stars are contracting and heating up very rapidly. So they have already moved across the HR diagram toward the main sequence. So we have a bunch of stars that are just beginning their lives, but we know the more massive ones evolved more quickly. So these ones are already starting to approach the main sequence, whereas the low mass stars are just sitting there. They won't reach the main sequence for a very long time. C. After about 100,000 years, these massive stars have ignited hydrogen fusion in their cores and have settled down onto the main sequence as O-type stars. So those three that you see pointed to are probably O-type stars, the most massive. And notice that other stars now are starting to come down onto the main sequence as they evolve. So, uh, let's see, L number, or letter D here. After about 3 million years, stars of moderate mass have also ignited core hydrogen fusion and become main sequence stars of spectral classes B and A. Meanwhile, low mass protostars continue to inch their way toward the main sequence uh, as, they're leisurely, uh, as they leisurely contract and heat up. Excuse me. So here we can see um, a lot of the stars now on the main sequence, maybe half of them or maybe a third but the least massive ones are still very far from ever reaching the main sequence. After 30 million years, the most massive stars have depleted the hydrogen in their cores and become red giants. These stars have moved from the upper left of end of the main sequence to the upper right corner of the HR diagram. Immediate mass stars, intermediate, excuse me, mass stars lie on the main sequence while the lowest mass stars are still in the protostar stage and lie above the main sequence. So these guys are getting close finally, but they still have not become actual stars. Intermediate mass stars, maybe like our sun, is on the main sequence. But notice that the most massive stars now have peeled off of this main sequence and have now come over to become red giants. After 66 million years, about twice as long as, the, as part E here, even the lowest mass protostars have finally ignited core hydrogen fusion and have settled down on the main sequence as cool, dim M-type stars. These lowest mass stars can continue to fuse hydrogen in their cores for hundreds of billions of years. In the final two HR diagrams, the main sequence stars get peeled or eaten away from the upper left to the lower right as stars exhaust their core supplies of hydrogen and evolve into red giants. The stars that leave the main sequence that have masses between one and three solar masses will undergo the helium flash in their core. So this is just a further step now. So now all of our low mass stars are on the main sequence, but even the intermediate mass stars now are starting to peel away to become red giants. And you see that especially after four and a half billion years. So this is very important. I'm not just showing you all of these slides for a reason. Uh, these eight HR diagrams are very important to understand. And this is a good reason why. We can observe the early stages of stellar evolution in open clusters, a loosely bound cluster which typically contains about a few hundred to a few thousand stars. Many open clusters are just a few million years old, so their HR diagrams resemble points D, E, and F in our pre previous simulation that I just showed you. 
Star clusters tend to form in a very short period of time compared to how long their stars shine, which means uh, each cluster has an age, the time since its formation. The figure here shows two open clusters of different ages. The nearby cluster, M35, uh, that's in the top right, must be relatively young, since it contains several dozen uh, luminous blue high-mass stars. These stars lie in the upper part of the main sequence on an HR diagram. They have main sequence lifetimes of only a few hundred million years, so M35 could be no older than that. Some of the most luminous stars in M35 are red and yellow in color. These are stars that ended up their main sequence lifetimes some time ago and have evolved into red giants. The HR diagram for this cluster resembles point G in the simulation. So let's look at G. Here it is. So notice it has a bunch of young stars maybe that are just becoming actual stars, but we see a lot of the other stars have peeled off of this main sequence now. So that's what this cluster is like. There are no high-mass blue star stars in, at all in NGC 2158, what you see down here in the bottom left, uh, which is a more distant cluster. Any such stars that were once in NGC 2158 have long since come to an end of their main sequence lifetimes. As a result, the main sequence in this cluster has been eaten away more than that of M35, leaving only stars that are yellow or red in color. This tells us that NGC 2158 must be older than M35. This example shows that uh, as a cluster ages, it generally becomes redder in its average color. We can see uh, even larger stages in stellar uh, evolution by studying the more dense clusters known as globular clusters, so-called because of their spherical shape. A typical globular cluster contains upwards of a million stars in its, in its volume less than 100 parsecs across. Among these are many highly evolved post-main sequence stars, which we will discuss in uh, a future lecture. The idea that a, star's, um, that a star cluster's main sequence is progressively eaten away is the key to determining the age of a cluster. In the HR diagram for a very young cluster, all of the stars are on or near the main sequence. As the cluster gets older, however, stars begin to leave the main sequence. The high mass, high luminosity stars are the first to concern, concern, excuse me, consume their core hydrogen and become red giants. As time passes, fewer and fewer stars remain on the main sequence. The age of a cluster can be found from the turnoff point, which is at the peak of the surviving portion of the main sequence star on a cluster's HR diagram. The stars at the turnoff point are just at the stage of exhausting hydrogen in their cores, so their main sequence lifetime is equal to the age of the cluster. Since we know the um, the main, where am I? Since we know the main sequence lifetimes of stars with different masses through modeling, we are able to determine how long ago the cluster formed. And you can see what we're talking about here, this turnoff point. So this is the main sequence going from bottom right to top left, but notice stars are being peeled off of that main sequence. Well, where they're being peeled off is the turnoff point, and that is how we determine ages of clusters. Since we know um, well, that's just a repeat. So that's kind of what we're looking at. So you can age a cluster based on their turnoff point. This figure here shows data for several star clusters plotted on a single HR diagram. This graph also shows turnoff point times from which the ages of the cluster can be estimated. Notice that the lower down the turnoff point occurs, which corresponds to lower masses moving off the main sequence, the older the cluster. Also notice how this corresponds to the color of the cluster, where older means redder in general. Right, so as you move from top to bottom, you'll notice that um, the age is getting much and much higher. That's because least massive stars have longer lifetimes. So this gives you an idea. So wherever you see these turnout points, you can estimate the age 
quite accurately for that star cluster. And that's where we'll leave it for today. So um, from here, we're going to talk about uh, the fate of these stars. So what's going to happen, say, to stars like our sun, stars more massive than our sun, um, because we already covered what happens to stars much less massive than our sun, right? It just turns into a ball of helium called a red dwarf, and that's it. So we're going to break it up and discuss two things now, the life and deaths of stars that are like our sun and those that are more massive. So I look forward to those lectures. We do get into a lot of detail, so do your best to understand what we are up to so far. Uh, and then I'll see you there. Take care.